Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Anything that moves, I don't get a hold of them. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week. We've got day two of training camp today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade continues. I'm Fran Duffy. And as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 337. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk where I catch up with Chris McPherson and Ben Fennell once again to break down what we saw from the practice field at the Novacare Complex. The Eagles taking the field once again for day two of training camp. We've got a lot to cover. It was a, it was a, not, not the best day out. It was a little bit cooler. The cloud coverage, we were scared that we we're going to get a little bit of rain, but thank Hopefully it stayed dry. The Eagles able to get a good day's work in. We've got a lot to break down. Myself, C-Mac, and Ben, we'll get to there in Chalk Talk. However, first up, I just want to remind you guys, if you haven't already, go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, wherever you listen. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. Appreciate everybody that has done that. If you've got a question about this Eagles team entering the 2021 season, now is the time. Jump on. Leave it in the in the comment box. We will answer it here on an upcoming show. Thanks so much to everybody that has already done so. Let's get this show rolling. I'm excited to talk through the second day of practice with Ben and Chris. It's time now for Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. All right, guys, well, plenty to get through here on day two of practice as I welcome in Chris McPherson, Ben Fennell. Guys, we are now uh, into the thick of things. Day two of training camp in the book. C-Mac, uh, excited to be back out there for another day. This one a little bit longer than yesterday, which was good. Into the thick of it. Into the thick of it. If you guys are on TikTok, you would know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I was nervous this morning uh, as you guys are shaking your heads. No. You're 0 for 2 on that one. Yeah, neither of us are yeah, on TikTok. I, I know, I know. <laughs> I got, I got. you know, my, my kids are 13 and 11. That's like literally the text chain to them is all TikTok links. Uh, nonetheless, though, I was nervous this morning because it started raining on the way into the building. And I said, we can't, not day two. Yeah. Like, don't force us inside day two. So... Um, cooler temperatures, a little bit longer of a practice uh, than yesterday. Yesterday was just kind of getting your feet wet with that hour, 15 hour, 20 minutes. So a little bit longer today, but really emphasizing after practice, uh, individual position work, getting that extra uh, tutelage in with the position coaches. So, but still uh, overall good workout, good atmosphere from the fans and uh, some exciting plays to talk about here today. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. If you didn't already, make sure you go check out our recaps from yesterday's practice, day one on Wednesday. You can do it one of two ways. You can either listen to yesterday's Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, or you can go on to PhiladelphiaEagles.com and check out our practice notes from all three of us, where we go a little bit de- uh, deeper than sometimes what we get into here on the pod, but uh, go through some different things that stood out to us over the course of the first day. And we will have that every single day that there is practice here at the NovaCare Complex. That said, uh, let's get going here today, guys. Well, C-Mac, we'll start with you. Uh, come to you for any transactions, any uh, injury report items, just newsworthy items here right off the top. So as we record this, no roster moves on the day. Now, there are still some open roster spots because of the three players, Andrew Adams, Matt Leo, Alex Singleton, on the reserve COVID list. The Eagles could add some players uh, to fill those spots. Um, the three players are still on the active physically unable to perform list and the non-football injury list, the Rodney McLeod, uh, LaRaven Clark and Landon Dickerson injury wise, a uh, new injury today, Brandon Brooks. He suffered a hamstring injury during practice left early, uh, just precautionary reasons, nothing expected to be long-term. So, but he did leave practice early today. Uh, Greg Ward. Missed yesterday's practice with the non-COVID illness. He returned but was limited. Uh, Travis Fulgham added him to their injury report. He's day-to-day with a lower body injury. Quez Watkins, day-to-day, a non-COVID illness. Uh, Offensive lineman Isaac Samalo has a hamstring injury. He's week-to-week. Jalen Rager, lower body tightness. I think he did some individual work, but he is day-to-day. Defensive back Shaquille Taylor, day-to-day with a lower body injury. And Nate Meadors is week to week with a hamstring injury. So that's the lowdown on the injuries uh, and the roster moves as we record this. So coming off of that, I'll kind of jump into <clears throat> some of the movement that we saw on the, you know, from a quote unquote depth chart. And I, I feel weird even saying depth chart because 
at this point with how much movement there is, I don't know that you you would even call it that. We're just continuing to see these guys shuffled in and out. But the big one that everyone's looking at yesterday, left tackle. We saw Andre Dillard get most of the first team reps. Day two, those appeared to be George Mailata. So we got that uh, in the first team spot on the blind side. At left guard, Nate Herbig still there, uh, starting ahead of Isaac Sayamalo. Isaac Sayamalo uh, on the sideline there, C-Mac. I just want to note with Nate Herbig, second day with the first team unit, Lane Johnson worked out with Nate Herbig. They're working together in Lane's barn in the offseason. And I spoke to Nate Herbig shortly after he went. And I think, Ben, you went to the OL Mastermind Summit uh, down in Frisco, Texas. So maybe you had a chance to interact with them. Uh, but Nate Herbig has basically been in Lane Johnson's pocket all offseason, has lost 30 pounds, is down to his lowest weight since his sophomore year of high school. Um, just realized the opportunity that's ahead of him, was disappointed in the way that he performed last season, getting to start, I believe it was 10 or 11 games as part of the rotation there, uh, especially when Isaac Sayomal suffered the knee injury. He felt he finished the year strong, but knew he needed to get his conditioning better, knew he needed to get his body in much better shape. And you always hear the, I'm in the best shape of my life uh, comments at this time of year, but 30 pounds slimmer, Looks the part there out there early these first couple of days there working at left guard. So I just wanted to note that with uh, with Nate. No, that's a good point. And, and so he was at left guard. And on the opposite side, you mentioned Brandon Brooks leaving with injury. Matt Pryor stepped in uh, at right guard for the rest of the day. At wide receiver, you mentioned Noquez Watkins, Greg Ward returning to the field, but wasn't always with the ones. J.J. Ortega-Whiteside got a lot of first team reps as well as John Hightower. John Hightower also mixing in with the first team here on Thursday. At linebacker, T.J. Edwards got first team reps ahead of Eric Wilson, who was a starter yesterday. We'll see what that rotation looks like tomorrow. And then at safety, Kayvon Wallace, uh, was no longer with the first team. Marcus Epps returned to the first team. So a lot of rotation at every single spot. Uh, we saw Josh Sweat and Derek Barnett get a share, you know, both get a share of first team reps. I know Jonathan Gannon said that he viewed both of them as starting quality players uh, and both are going to play a ton. So not really a surprise to see them get a, a rotation there of the first team snaps, but so many positions up for grabs. It's a lot of fun to kind of follow this. That being said, uh, let's get into our big takeaways here. And just kind of one thing that stood out to us as we walk away from the day, Ben, I'll come to you first. Well, I just feel like one guy's absence is another guy's opportunity. You know, whether it's, you know, Isaac Sayamalo not ready yet and Herbig sliding in at left guard, getting very comfortable playing next to Kelsey and alongside Mulata and Dillard. And then we saw Brandon Brooks go out. Doesn't seem serious, but that means Matt Pryor comes up on the ones. And it just seems like this emphasis and focus on competition at every position. And like you had just mentioned, there's no depth chart. This is the type of team, once we put out the depth chart, that next day at practice, he's going to boggle up the roster once again and never let you know who we're going to roll out and what the combination of safeties are going to be or outside linebackers or interior linemen. I just love that there seems to be in every period, in every session of practice, a new kind of dynamic. And it seems like he really wants to mix and match and find out who's going to rise to the top. And I think the best way to do that is get different guys playing alongside one each other, one another and you know mixing up every day. To follow up on that, Ben, it's interesting you say that because Lane Johnson noted during his press conference that every single session, every drill is charted by the coaches who won, who lost. And at the end of every practice, media members will say, oh, I think the offense won today. I think the defense won today. They tell the team at night who won the day. So the defense had the clear advantage. I think we all saw that with our eyes and it was uh, it showed up on the tape as well. Lane thinks the offense, uh, definitely a better day for the offense overall. And Lane thinks that the offense will have gotten the upper hand. He wasn't sure because this was before they came out with the final charting numbers. But Nick Sirianni preaching competition, and you are seeing that come through in every way, shape, and form, that every single part of practice is charted. And that's something that's new for Lane Johnson, who has worked with um, going back now. This is his third head coach here since he was drafted fourth overall by the Eagles in 2013. Well, as we know, Sirianni's competitive, but these players are competitive. They want to know the score too. And you better believe these coaches are keeping score and they want to know the score at the end of the day. And they want to keep track of the wins and losses and have pride for their unit or their side of the ball. And all that is important. You know, we're trying to get better and work on our craft and our technique. It's still a game and about wins and losses. 
you know, every play is an opportunity to win and to lose. So you always want to know where, you, where you're at and what the score is at the end of the day. And then for us on the outside, too, I think it's important when it comes to these depth chart changes to kind of take a, t- a step back and remember, like, it's important but don't overreact to the changes because I don't think that that necessarily means that, Oh, you know, like it'll take like free safety or our linebacker. Right. I don't think that you say, Oh man, well, TJ Edwards was great yesterday and now he's sliding in and Eric Wilson was bad yesterday. No, like they want to see all these guys and how they react to all the different changes, you know, whether it's guys in the offensive line playing next to each other, you want to see guys play different positions. You want to look at safety and say, all right, well, uh, you know, look, what does this guy look like? How does he get to communicate if the, if he's in there with the starting lineup? And you're always trying to get that evaluations, whether it's with new players, guys that are new to the team or younger players that you're trying to see get an expanded role. So I, I think that's important to remember here as we go through the rest of camp, uh, kind of changing gears here for me. One guy that just kind of stood out, just walking away from the football field today. Uh, I felt like 91 just showed up time and time and time again uh, with Fletcher Cox. And to me, like early on in training camp, you're doing one of two things. If you're us on the outside, right? If you're a media members, you're looking for the young guys that are making that next step. Oh, does this guy look a little bit better? Is he playing a little bit faster? Uh, You know, what does he look like in year two or in year three? And then conversely, you're also keeping an eye on like some of the older guys and you're like, all right, well, is this guy going to lose a step? Is he not moving as well as he used to? Does he still not have that same pop on contact? I don't think we're seeing a lot of it, a huge, huge difference here from Fletcher Cox from 2020 to 2021. I think he's still uh, that guy. He was around the football a lot today. We saw him chasing down plays out to the perimeter a couple of times. Um, yeah, constantly wrapping. I know there were a, a two or three plays where I wrote down in my notebook, uh, 91 quickly wraps up running back very quickly at the line of scrimmage wraps up running back grabs running back. So, uh, you know, Fletcher Cox all, all over the field, which was good to see C-Mac. I mean, when just, Six straight Pro Bowls for a reason. He's still one of the elite linemen in the entire National Football League. So uh, no question that he wants to show his dominance. And, you know, I'm sure you have Javon Hargrave, who's on the come up, uh, looking good early on here in train camp. They use a a high draft pick on Milton Williams. Fletcher Cox, going back to your competition angle, Ben, wants to show that, look, I'm the centerpiece of this defense. I'm the one that this unit is being built around. C-Mac, what was your big takeaway? Yeah, I guess I'll go with the emphasis on takeaways as well as preventing yeah. them. So, Stephen Nelson, New Eagles corner, uh, during his press conference today, met with the media for the first time, said, look at my knuckles, okay, just uh, how beat up and bruised they are uh, from trying to punch the ball out and get the ball out. And that's something that Jonathan Gannon, with his hits principle, which is hustle, intensity, takeaways, and smarts, that's kind of his uh, philosophy for building this defense. Well, you are certainly seeing that, especially when it comes to the takeaways. They are trying to get the ball out each and every opportunity. Now, if you have watched some of our content uh, leading up to training camp, we, we had our mic'd up feature called Audible, and you hear the coaches time and time again talking about clasp hands, clasp hands. Well, it's securing the football, make sure it can't get punched out. One of the new drills is uh, the coaches will have boxing gloves at the end of polls, trying to punch out the ball from the receivers and the running backs. So they are trying their best to try to make sure they know how to protect the football. So certainly Nick Sirianni and Jonathan Gannon really working on the emphasis of trying to create the turnovers, which has been a problem and also preventing them from taking place. So that's my big takeaway from today. Yeah, there was a play yesterday where the defense got all juiced up. Craig James poked the ball out on the goal line and took it back late. And then uh, today, I think it was the second team period, it was either the second or the third team period. Uh, Jannard Avery it was a play late in the in the session. Um, he went and, and punched the ball out late along the sideline. Defense swarms all over the football. Uh, a lot of excitement. So, and you could just see on every single play, guys are always just poking the ball out, poking the ball out. So, uh, and that helps obviously the offensive guys too. Everybody, uh, there's certainly an emphasis, like you said, uh, on protecting the ball and creating those turnovers. Now, uh, let's get to the next one here. Our big question, and my big question for you guys today, we're now two days into practice, obviously both both days in shorts. We're not going to go crazy here with an overreaction, but who's a player who's flashed? And it's just just a guy, it might have been something small. It doesn't, you know, I mentioned Fletcher Cox, or that's kind of low-hanging fruit. Is If there's a guy that just, you know what, this guy uh, stood out to me a little bit. C-Mac, I'll come to you first. Uh, I'm going to go, one of the underrated position battles is the depth at tight end because there are so many 
Uh, there's a couple of project guys, uh, you know, guys making the transition from quarterback if you're Tyree Jackson, wide receiver if you're Hakeem Butler, over to tight end to try to fortify the depth there behind Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard and, and Richard Rodgers, obviously as a veteran. I'm going to go with a Caleb Wilson, okay? Uh-huh. Has had a couple, had a diving catch in practice yesterday. Fran, you put that in the, in our notes if you read them on Philadelphia.com and the app. Uh, had a nice catch over the middle from Nick Mullins. They took him from for a score to close out the team drill today. Uh, got a taste of playing action last season uh, for the team, trying to look to build upon that. But uh, a natural tight end by position, plays college ball at UCLA. Father, you might recognize the last name, Wilson. Father was the uh, defensive line coach, Chris Wilson, for the Super Bowl team. Um, so, you know, athletic, easy mover, someone who's definitely going to look to turn some eyes here. So I'll, I'll put that as someone, look, maybe he's made a couple of plays, but we're not going to overreact. Yeah, I'm actually going to go a similar kind of player. I'm going to go with a second-year undrafted free agent, Luke Jariga, who the Eagles signed after the draft in 2020 out of Western Michigan, I believe. A really athletic kid. Uh, I remember studying him coming out. But just watching him now, just the first couple of days, especially like today in one-on-ones, I thought he looked really good. He, he's a really scrappy player. He's got light feet. He was able to drop his anchor and kind of hold on to the bull rush uh, a couple of times today. So I'm going to go with Luke Jariga as a name that has really kind of flashed to me. Ben, is there a, a guy that stands out for you? Well, I'll get in the sophomore campaign like you guys, uh, and I'll go with second-year linebacker Davion Taylor, who we mm. saw quite a bit today, quite often playing behind that dominant Fletcher Cox in a snap right. linebacker role. But he was the first-team linebacker with T.J. Edwards in team period one, two, three, the blitz period. So he seemed like a fixture of the starters with the ones out there. And with all the perimeter action and the misdirection and the boots and the rollouts, you really get to see him put his foot in the ground and open up his speed and pursue the football. And this guy goes from A to B in a hurry, many times overlapping the play side linebacker. He's just that fast when he sees it. So not a whole lot between the tackles going on so far now that they're not in pads yet. But the perimeter action, Davion Taylor has been very impressive. And luckily he gets the benefits of playing behind big Fletcher Cox, which uh, being a stacked linebacker behind 91 is certainly a luxury. You know, I think you talk about a guy that you're hoping will make that jump in year two. And I, I think when you look at Davion Taylor, it's like, all right, well, the guy hasn't played a ton of football. Obviously, the offseason was shortened last year uh, and, the, you know, didn't see a ton of time on defense during the season. So now let's let's just get him reps, as many reps as possible. Uh, and it's been exciting just to kind of watch him and, and see him make plays from sideline to sideline. Uh, it's good to be able to say, to, honestly, too. You see Eric Wilson get moved back to the second team. Well, we'll see if uh, if Davion Taylor is able to you know still be uh, with that first team unit as we get to uh, as we get to tomorrow and the, and the day after that. Um, speaking of which, you mentioned no contact yet, no tackling. Uh, we will see. I believe I was I was talking with Dave Spadaro earlier today on the pre- live practice stream, which you can check out by the way, 10 a.m. every day when the Eagles get ready to start practice. Dave Spadaro and I will be live on all of the Eagles channels. So whether it's on the app. PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles social channels. You can go on and we will be live streaming the first part of practice. And uh, David mentioned he believes that the pads will go on on Monday. So uh, you've got a couple of practices here. Team has off on Sunday. Pads go on Monday is the, is the thought process. So we'll see uh, if that is actually what the timing is. Um, let's go to our plays of the day. Uh, we've got, I've got a couple options here. Uh, but Ben, I missed this play. And it's got, I didn't see it. So I'm excited to get your recollection of it. Uh, it looked like I saw the very tail end during the seven on seven drill, a big play to Devontae Smith. Yeah, I had a great window here. I was out on the far field, kind of lined right with the line of scrimmage as the team was in the middle of the field here. But one of the more explosive down the field plays we've seen in two days in practice. I can't say the offense has been pushing the ball down the field in the past game too often. But Devontae Smith was on, was on the receiving end of a, I think, a 60 or 70 yard fade uh, this afternoon. It looked like the defense came in a too high look. One of the safeties came down that left him one on one with a single high safety in the middle of the field. Jalen Hurts double clutched just a little bit. That caused the safety to also double clutch. But Devontae Smith, he cooked corner Steven Nelson off the line of scrimmage, and Jalen Hurts dropped a really nice ball deep down the field before that single high safety could make his way to the sideline. But it was one of the few kind of 40, 50, 60 plus plays down the field we've seen so far in practice. And seeing it from number one, Jalen Hurts, to our young first round pick, Devontae Smith. I think it's just a little bit of a flash of what's to come. And it got a lot of people excited. It's all 
heard and saw a couple of woos in the crowd. And that was definitely the, my highlight play of two days in practice. I, I will say I was over watching the offensive lineman and the defensive lineman going through one-on-ones. And yeah, that uh, was so a seven I, on seven session. Yeah. As well. So yeah. I, so I had my t- back turned to that drill to that, to the seven on sevens. And I just hear the fans go nuts and I turn around and there's Devonte Smith walking into the end zone. I was like, Oh man, I missed it. I can't wait to but talk. You just don't know how he got there because exactly. a lot of times the ball carriers will finish the play. Even if it's a handoff, they'll run the whole thing out. You don't always know how he ended up all the way at the end zone. Right. This was a through and through explosive downfield pass play, which we haven't seen too much uh, through two, two days of practice. So uh, I mentioned that I was watching the O-line D-line one-on-one. So I'll just tell you my, my favorite rep from today um, actually came from another rookie, uh, another uh, draft pick here for the Eagles. And this was a little bit late in the, in the session, but it was a, a pass rush from Teron Jackson, uh, the rookie uh, sixth round pick from coastal Carolina. And here's what he, he won high side. He's known as more of a pass r- as a uh, power rusher, right? He's going to run through you as the offensive tackle. He won with a little high side, like uh, Ben, he went with like one of those Euro step, like a basketball player, Euro step cross chop where he was able to get the edge on Casey Tucker and then flatten and turn the corner. It was a really nice high side rush outside rush. And I think that's big because how often you know, we, we've talked about this a lot with Derek Barnett, right? We talked about it with Josh Sweat developing pass rushers. If, if you've got a way, if you win inside or if you win outside, it's so important for you to develop that counter, that ability uh, to win both ways. Once you get to the NFL, Teron Jackson known as a power rusher, what are you going to do? You're going to set up the power rush with that Euro step, right? You're going to try and get the tackle to think, Oh, he's coming into my chest. He shoots his hands, and now all of a sudden you can get the edge and turn the corner. That's what exactly what Teron Jackson did. Uh, he's going to need moves like that in order to find NFL success. I thought that was really good to be able to see him really uh, flatten out and turn the corner, uh, especially. I thought that was a really impressive rush. It was uh, good to Fran see was that. More excited by, Fran was probably more excited by that than uh, the Devontae Smith touchdown. So. Especially because I didn't like, see it. Uh, since, uh, well, since I didn't see the Devontae Smith play, it was uh, it was easy for me to be more excited. Uh, but it was, a, uh, it was awesome. It was a really nice rush, you know. I'm going to go with Miles Sanders. He took a last team period. He took a stretch run, started out to the left and then bounced it back to the right, uh, outflanked the defense and took it up the sideline for a huge gain. And uh, it's great to see him at the start of camp. Okay. Out there, healthy, out there, ready to go. Um, Obviously looking for big things in year three, talked after practice, especially about the mechanics and fundamentals of, his role in the past game because he had 50 catches as a rookie and had some struggles in that department last year. So we talked about the work that he's trying to do to make sure that uh, he's overcoming that to get back to, especially the way we've seen Nick Sirianni use running backs in the past game. I believe last season Indianapolis running backs were second in receiving yards to only new Orleans, if I'm correct on that stat. So certainly they're going to have a big role here. Um, but good to see Miles Sanders out, out of the gate. There's a couple of key guys like that, that last year they were slowed by injury at the start, but you see them, uh, you know, foot on the pedal early on the camp, and Miles is one of those guys, so great to see that from him. So I still don't think it's as good as the Devontae Smith touchdown. Uh, maybe it's as good as the Teron Jackson Euro chop uh, move, but nonetheless, though, go with Miles Sanders there for my play of the day. Uh, I think that the the staff, especially you mentioned, like you, Nick Sirianni coming from the Colts, Shane Steichen coming from the Chargers, where Austin Eckler has caught so many passes, Jamel Singleton coming from Cleveland, where Kareem Hunt has caught a bunch of passes. Uh, this is a staff that knows how to get the running back to football uh, in the passing game. I think that will be big for Miles Sanders moving forward. Guys, I don't know if I'm missing anything else. Or, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody chime in. Uh, ben, am I missing anything here? Well, I always just think it's interesting that practice on paper is from 10 to noon. But there's a lot to take away before practice and a lot to take away after practice. Mm. You could really be out there for a full three hours, maybe a half hour before, half hour after, and pick up on a lot of guys spending time working on their craft on their own time. Whether it's pre-practice working on the jugs and the hands machines or post-practice like a rookie Zach McPherson working on punt gunning knowing that special teams are going to be a big aspect of him being involved this year. And then the second he's finished with punt gunning, you see him with a nice tray of Rita's bringing over uh, for all the defensive backs out there, that little playful rookie hazing from that group. But just to see what guys are working on pre-practice, post-practice, don't run right to those media sessions, C-Max. Stay out there because you're going to pick <laughs> up some information, all right? <laughs> all right, so uh, on, I'll follow up with that with Eric Wilson. Okay. So new to the Eagles, but obviously a veteran was outstanding for, for the Vikings previously. Um, 
But he was out there speaking of the media sessions. He's out there on the field, I think like 1230 or so, working on bag drills on his alignment, his, his gap responsibility, where his eyes are supposed to be, where, where he's supposed to pursue to the ball. It, it was just, it's getting to the point where he's like fending off like the grounds crew, the grounds crew trying to get the fields ready for the next practice. And he's like, give me, give me a minute. I got to finish up with a couple of things here. So the crowds were gone. All the other players were gone. It was just a few players who were doing media stuff. Eric Wilson in that 50 Jersey still out there on the field, uh, getting that fundamental work in. And I just love that there's no consistency to who's out there. You're going to have the rookies, the undrafted claw and just, trying to do whatever they can. Maybe somebody's changing positions. Then you have guys that are new to the team, like, you know, Anthony Harris's and Eric Wilson's. And then you just have those wily old vets that have their routine, that have their process, that always are working on their craft pre and post practice. So I just like the variety of players all out there, all being professional. And that's what you want from an organization, a team. You want that kind of tone setting, that leadership. And it's, a, it's really an infectious work style. And I'm glad to see it. Yeah, that's a great point that you guys make. Ben, you you hit the nail on the head. There's so much you can glean uh, by staying after practice and just uh, watching who's who's getting what work in. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to do that each and every day. You could see these guys practice up close in person. All you have to do is just go to one of the Eagles' public practices. If you're a local here to the Philadelphia area, they are holding two public practices over at Lincoln Financial Field. The first one, it's come right around the corner. We're talking about August 8th, so only a few days away here uh, from the first public practice. Make sure you go over to PhiladelphiaEagles.com. You can get more info on uh, how to get tickets for that. All ticket proceeds uh, go to the Eagles Autism Foundation. So, but uh, Ben, Chris, outstanding stuff as always. We will check in with both of you guys tomorrow with another day of Eagles training camp practice. Great stuff um, from both of those guys. You can follow them both on Twitter, just like I do. While you're at it, I'm at EaglesXOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here with Eagles Entertainment. And you know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on social media. That's one way to support the show. But the other way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating and leave us a comment. And I want to give a shout out today to someone who did exactly that. Right him, left a five-star review with a great question saying, uh, Fran, I've got a big question. I was wondering if you could explain or have a coach explain the purpose of a defensive line or a linebacker shift. Is it just about gap discipline and responsibilities or is there more to it than that? So, um, well, it's a great question, and really there's a couple different ways to look at it. I guess if it's a shift that's in response to an offensive shift, so let's say uh, the tight end moves or a running back changes, you know, the, the formation changes, something like that, then, yeah, you, that's what it, it's going to ultimately a bit be about run responsibilities and who has what gap. Uh, if you are a pure, uh, if you're, if the front is going to be Mac locked in to what the offensive formation is, then if the tight end flips sides, goes from the left to the right, you might have – your entire defensive line and your linebacker switch from left to the right. And that just kind of depends on a down to down basis. But typically when you see a defensive line shift, that's what it's about. But it also could be about disguise as well. And again, it depends on without knowing an individual play. Uh, it's tough for me to say that, but I will say that some of that can be disguised as well. Hey, you want to show the offense one thing before the snap. And then afterwards, you're going to have a couple of quick little adjustments. And now all of a sudden the protection scheme they set, well, that's not going to be blocking exactly what they said it to. Because remember, uh, you know, you can't change the protection after the snap of the ball. The protection is the protection after the snap. So uh, I say, you know, I would say that it's one of those two things, just depending on the shift. So, Will, it's a great question. And thanks to everybody out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcasts here with Eagles Entertainment. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I am Fran Duffy. We will talk to you tomorrow.